Um, so we are on the Colin Can Help podcast. We have Alicia Caldwell Henderson. Um, go ahead and let everybody know from their early days. Um, what, where did you grow up? Where are you from? And all of those fun things. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. So I'll try not to be long winded, but um, I currently live in Jacksonville, Florida, right outside of it. Um, I grew up in Kentucky, though, London, Kentucky, small town. Um, my parents are both from a smaller town, Manchester, Kentucky. After they got together, they moved to London, started their life. Um, I lived there until I was about 15. And that was when my dad received a transfer from his job, CSX, and we came to Florida. I was super excited um, to just get outside of Kentucky and see something different and be exposed to different types of people. Yeah, I mean, uh, you moved there, you said when you were 15. What was that like adapting from being the uh, teenager in Kentucky to moving to the whole new culture? What was the adjustment like for you? Okay, so prior to moving to Kentucky, you know, I had, I mean, moving to Florida, I had lots of great friends in Kentucky. I mean, even now we still keep up with each other on Facebook and we comment about our children and how they look like us at that age and da 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 da. Uh, but I was always, because Kentucky is so small, I was always usually the only person of color in my classes. So moving to Florida, I was. It was, it was it was it was a culture shock, but then it was a welcoming one because I wasn't the only person of color in all my classes anymore. There were more people who looked like me who had more of the same interests that I did. So I made some you know some good connections. Gotcha. And uh, so you moved there when you were fifteen. When did uh, everybody that's watching this knows you as an author? When did the author start? Was that as something as an early age? Just picked up a pen. How did the career as an author begin? That started as an early age um, when I was younger, and I, I have to credit my mother for it because she was really involved in making sure that she introduced all of us. To, uh, so I have two siblings, but she did a great job of introducing us to reading at an early age. Um, and she would read to us, take us to the library often. We would always check out books. Um, and it's probably through her that I was introduced to, you know, the Nancy Drew series and the Boxcar Children series. And I would read those. And I really became so involved in mystery books reading Nancy Drew that I decided I wanted to write um, and I took one of my dad's like folders from his job something he had extra I loved when he had extra stuff from work the office supplies because I could take it away <laughs> um, but I took the folder I already had paper and it was like a two-pronged folder and I just started writing the mystery of something I don't even remember now but I decided my pen name was gonna be Michelle Auburn Michelle is my middle name Auburn don't know where that came from but I started writing just a little bit. I mean, I was young. I was like nine, ten at the time. Um, so as I continued in my education, I, I became a strong writer. I mean, even in college, if my classes were based on essays, I was getting an A. And I would wait to the last minute because I did my best work, you know, at the last minute, unfortunately. But I, I had an A every single time. Um, but in high school, I wrote for my newspaper staff. I became the editor my last year of college. Um, I went on that, I mean, sorry, my last year of high school, I was the, the editor of the newspaper. And then I continued that track um, on through college. But it wasn't until my last semester of college that I decided that I didn't want to write the way that I thought I did, because I wanted to be a journalist. Um, but in my last semester, that's when I was in, ed in an editorial and columns writing class, and so we were really learning about how to write opinion pieces. Um, but this also happened, or I was in that class when September 11th happened. So prior to September 11th, we were analyzing the paper, looking at all the commentary, and all of the articles were about the biggest thing in the news at the time, which were shark attacks in the ocean. Um, right after September 11th happened. No more shark attacks. <laughs> right, no more shark attacks. Everything was centered around that one event and then different articles and opinion pieces spawned specu with speculations about what happened, what could happen, who's next. And I remember writing a column, you know, just saying that as media, we need to be more responsible in what we put out there because we don't want to manipulate people. 
And so whenever I turned it in, my professor looked at me, and I'll never forget this moment, but she looked at me and she said, you know, the media is a business too. So it was at that moment that I knew I, I couldn't write, um, I couldn't write for a newspaper because I didn't want to manipulate people. Gotcha. And with, within that, uh, what you just told us, you kind of touched on a little bit more of your background, uh, the college part. Uh, your college includes, you have a de bachelor's degree in communications and media studies, but also a master's degree in educational psychology. Is that right? That's correct. I did my research right. Thank you LinkedIn, for that one. <laughs> um, so you went, I'm guessing the uh, communications, that was kind of the idea that you wanted to be the writer. Um, but what made you switch? Was it because that you didn't want to manipulate people that you wanted to go into the child education and the psychology angle of that? Well, okay, so whenever I decided I didn't want to manipulate people with writing, I was, I guess like every other college student who just graduated, you know, trying to find my place and trying to find a niche. Um, and so I ended up, you know, a friend at church, he was working for a company called the Paxton Group at the time, and he needed an instructor. And so part of the company or part of the program, um, it was a nonprofit, but it was sponsored by the Florida National Guard. But what they did was taught life skills and employability skills to adults who were receiving um, assistance. And so I was able to get into that. I learned how to teach basically. I had two instructors who worked with me to, you know, help guide me and direct me on what I needed to do. And after a few years doing that, I was then promoted to site manager of the sister program, which was for the youth. Um, so then I went out and I recruited students and for them it was even better because they were able to, it was a job for them, they were able to make money by coming to this program and learning life skills and employability skills. So it was in that process of working with them that I said, oh, okay, I, you know, I like working with, you know, youth and young adults because I was able to see what they learned, um, how they learned, and just see how proud of themselves they were by the end of the, the program because we did a huge graduation where we celebrated and invited you know their parents and community community members and everyone out so um but budget cuts started happening at a certain point um during i guess during our little our recession that we had and so my job was cut but at the time um at the time my job was cut, that was when I decided to start pursuing my master's um, because I, I decided that I did like working with young people, but I wanted to take it and educate it, educate them in a different way. And I was thinking, you know, I could I could be a curriculum writer. I could, you know, figure out how to write curriculum and, and do things. Let me focus on the educational standpoint, but also learn more about their psyche so I know how to um, how to do it and where was it that you uh that that education that was what capella university yes capella university and where and, is capella university um capella is in minneapolis minnesota um i did it all online it is i mean in order to get your education online you have got to be very disciplined and set schedules and set you know set goals um but I think by here, though, I had already written my book because Ashlyn, my oldest daughter, was two at the time I started um, pursuing my degree. My book, I started writing um, when I was teaching the adults. No. Was I teaching? I don't even remember. <laughs> so many people, you lost track. Oh, my gosh. But I just remember <laughs> I wrote this before I had children, and that was before I started you know, pursuing, pursuing my master's. I had had it, um, I finished it in 2003. So that that was whenever I was working with the adults. So I finished it in 2003. Um, and, you know, and in that time I was still working with youth, but at church, because I was in youth ministry, um, working with the teens. I was just, so I, have, I need to create a timeline for myself. <laughs> That's all right. Um, but let, let's go more into the book since you uh, put it in front of us and it's such a great thing to talk about anyways. The title is Young, Dumb, and Naive. Yes. Um, it, you wrote it yourself, correct? Mm -hmm. And you also published it yourself. Yes. 
what can you tell us? Because uh, you've also had a little bit of experiences way back when with more, the more traditional publishing route. Uh, what can you say as a self-published author, you know, even though you don't have the exact timeline about the whole process from beginning of conception to idea to you're actually printing your own hard copies too, aren't you? Yes. Um, tell us all about that. That sounds like about an hour's worth of thing. I'll just go walk away and come back and just be <laughs> educated. Yes, <laughs> not for me too. Um, no, so when I wrote it, um, you know, I, I was teaching the adults, right? I was active in youth ministry, but you know, I'm also an avid reader. I, I love reading. Uh, my friends and I, we had started this book club and we just wanted to get together and, you know, read the same book and talk about it. It was the best thing ever. So they introduced me to an author named Victoria Christopher Murray. And so um, I, her first book that we read was Temptation about a married couple. The wife had to go away for business. She came back. Her husband had slept with her best friend. I mean, it was just so much drama happened in the book. But the aspect that she came from, came that she discussed was, you know, just being able to make it through situations, especially when, you know, you're a married couple and you decided or you, you want to be able to stick together, but you, this, this whole thing that has happened has crushed your marriage. How do you move forward? So I learned a lot through her characters, um, um, through her characters, and you just, you know, and I was able to take in some advice that I wanted to be able to, to, take with me into a marriage whenever I got married. Um, my husband and I at that time were just dating, but you know, I kind of knew that we would eventually be together. Not to say that I would ever expect a scenario like this in the book, <laughs> but I do, I did, I was able to learn from, you know, just the interact, the interactions of the characters. So for me, after reading it, I said, you know, I've got this passion for young people. How can I do the same thing for young people, young adults, and address some of the things that they deal with on um, a daily basis. So after thinking about that, I then started thinking about people who inspire me, people who I look at. And anytime I think about inspirations, I can just pick from anybody in my family because they're we've got a large family <laughs> and everyone in our family has a story. So I started thinking about, you know, just one particular individual and how she is an inspiration to me, even though she's younger than me, but just seeing some of the things that she had to go through as a child, um, as it related to, you know, her age and her relationship with her mom and, you know, how it changed over a period of time, but how she didn't let that stop her. And she was able to get herself out there and shift her focuses away from what was happening at home so she could become the person that she wanted to be. So I, I looked at her as an inspiration for the character. So a lot of the characters that are in my book, some of the things that happen are just loose. I don't wanna say they're based off of anybody in my family, but I, they're inspired. There's, there's, I mean, it's hard not to include some sort of influence though. Um, I talked with a lot of authors and a lot of them, you know, they're always like, well, somebody came up to me and was like hey i read your book and this really sounds a lot like me or a conversation you or i had and uh it's really one of those where um what was the quote uh, an author that was also on one of our author showcases uh kristen ward had a thing she just posted today saying that uh authors are the truly true magicians that uh, you create worlds that never even existed. Uh, I, I kind of screw that quote up. She, she did it way better because she's a writer and I just talk about things. Uh, but but no, she's that, right. that she's so right with that though because you take the you take what you you perceived as your own reality and you have the ability through a couple of drafts to kind of just recreate the truth in a form of fiction where it's right. not but it's just, you're not using that character but you're using no, influence but just the basis of their emotions and what you imagine them to feel like and then you can just take it around and run it's it's so i mean it's so amazing how it happens because i even remember sitting down you know writing the book you know as i'm writing like i didn't know I didn't know how I would get to the end. I didn't know all the little pieces that would take place. It was just in the moment as I was typing, typing and the characters came to life and they just kind of did their own thing. Absolutely. 
Um, and tell us more about developing a character. Um, everybody has their own process. I fully understand that. But do you like to kind of make an outline for things and fill it in? Or do you kind of just go all together and hope it comes together? How does it work putting together an entire book and making it all make sense? So for me, I have to sketch out my characters first. I have to know what they look like. I have to know what their personalities are um, before I can even... Can, once I have the basis of who they are, what they look like, what their interests are, then I can build scenes and activities and kind of already know my advice, paying attention gotcha. to my reference sheet in the beginning, how it is that they would just respond based on who I who I want them to be, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that I'm makes in, sense. I'm in that process now with the, the next book. I'm fleshing out my characters. And do we have a title for that next book? No, we don't. No, we don't. I, it's going to be pretty deep, though. <laughs> That's all right. We have, enough want... with the, we have enough with the other book to talk about. So yeah. let's keep going a little bit deeper into the self-published thing. thing. I know that you worked with a publisher before, and that kind of didn't work out. Um, you kind of shelved the book, but you didn't want to give up. Um, I know your husband, shout out to your husband, kind of pushed you a little bit. Um, yeah. But what made it seem accessible the second time around to do it yourself where it didn't the first? Um, I think more experience for myself. Um, Cause you know, the first time around, you know, I had all of the training from school and from college. So I knew to do the writer's market book and use that as my writing Bible. Um, I knew to send the query letters and I knew to have a manuscript and I knew to contact whoever the publisher I was seeking to see how they wanted to receive the manuscript. Um, but after the deal fell through, you know, I, I'm always, I'm always finding different things to keep myself involved in. Um, so on the side, I did a little graphics design and layout for a little while. So I built up some experience there. Um, so having some of these background pieces really made it easy because you know, with that experience, I know what I wanted my book to look like. I know right. what I wanted the layout to look out, look like, and I knew how to get it done, you know, just with the experience I had in the different programs. Um, so I really have enjoyed the use of Amazon um, and just how, how easy they, how easy, easily accessible it is for those who want to take advantage of the services that they offer. And uh, you, you made the really good keyword phrase right there, the easy accessibility of Amazon, which is really why Amazon is who they are. Everything from their publishing to their delivery, all of that is just so accessible. And they make everything so easy to where, why would you do it anywhere else? Um, right, because I will say, because, you know, after, you know, after the my book deal fell through years ago, I did kind of look into self-publishing at that time. But, you know, that was, a little over 10 years ago, right? And I don't know if you're familiar with that world from then, but if you wanted to do self-publishing then, you had to pay up front so much money um, in advance so that they could have everything ready for you. With Amazon, you don't have to do that. You only pay for what you need. And right. they charge you based on what it costs them to print the book, which is, you know, fair. Mm -hmm. So you use Amazon to do your printing, is that right? Yes. And uh, how do how I've not done that part of it. How does that work? Once they put the, is it print to order? As soon as they order it, they print a new copy, or do you have to get like a small batch of them? No, you, if you just want one that you want to print up, you can pay for that one. Um, you go through your KDP site, and you mm -hmm. um, there's a link for author copies. Gotcha. So you order the number of author copies you want. Yeah, I, I've only put up one thing on the uh, the Amazon KDP. I, a couple of weeks or I guess a couple months already. It's amazing how time flies. Uh, but I went through the uh, Google Analytics course on the Google website, and uh, they they have great videos and everything. But each each there's probably five different ones, and it's about forty or fifty questions. So just to kind of maximize my time, like I talked to you about, kind of documenting the process of things while I learn things. I try to figure out how to make it easier for other people to learn things. So right. also while I was working with, with writers, I decided 
no brainer. I'd like to do graphic design. I know how to do layout. I know how to do all those things. And I got a hundred percent on the entire certification. So I know all the answers to the certification. Why don't I just make a real quick, easy to read five, 10 pages thing that goes over every answer, every keyword and put it out there. So not only can people learn from that, but then I also was able to learn the KD, KDP process. And it's so easy to wow. upload the book. Um, with yours, how did you do the actual manuscript? Did you do it all through Word and upload it? Did you do it through a PDF creator? How did you go about that? I actually did it all through Microsoft Word. Um, and like I said, I had a background in design, so I know, like, I knew what I wanted every page to look like. Um, so I've been through several different title changes. So <laughs> my last edit, when I decided I wanted the, the title to be Young, Dumb, and Naive, I literally went through every single page on um, in Microsoft Word so I could change, you know, the break in the scene because I had something else written there, but I wanted to change it to YDN. <laughs> so I had to comb through every single page to do it. Um, but no, it, I mean, it was, it's, it was easy, simple. And as simple and easy as it is, and you've done, it sounds like just about everything from the writing to the design yourself. Uh, what did you do about editing? Every person that I talk to says that you need, even if you are competent, even if you're an English teacher, that you need to go with a professional editor. What did you do? Um, well, after, because you remember, I, I did send it out to Walkworthy Press um, to be published through them. So the edits that I had made originally spawned from what they suggested, and then I mm -hmm. sent it back to them. Gotcha. Um, so I just kind of left it as it is after that. I mean, but next go around, I, you know, through our through the, the writing networks on Facebook and whatever else, I'll, I'll find um, an editor after doing my research, of course, because I'm a believer in researching. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anybody that's not researching, you're wasting your time. You could spend an hour on any topic and be so much ahead of the game if you and i don't know why we live in the information age we just talked the other day about libraries and accessibility of things but yet people will read a three second thing on a, a instagram post and think of it as fact but not take the extra hour to kind of dive into it and see why is that fact or is that even fact right it blows my mind because there's so much access because you know we mentioned before you'd have to look at an encyclopedia and hope it's there, but you don't even have to do that anymore. Just Google and sift through the articles that you find. And speaking of Google and articles, uh, what from the educator standpoint, I know uh, when I was going through school, I loved Wikipedia because it made everything easy, no. but it doesn't really have the same credibility because of the user changes. Is there a particular um, online resource that you either yourself or recommend to your children or students to kind of go to just as a, a good scholarly resource? So let me just say this. In middle school, we no longer really teach research papers. So we haven't had an actual need for that as of late. Um, we Did you just say in middle school you don't have to write research papers anymore? No, 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 we don't do research papers anymore. Um, so what we spend a lot of time on though, however, you know, we, we're not necessarily doing research papers, but what we do is we provide students with sources and we do talk about credible sources and ways to identify them. And we teach kids to stay away from Wikipedia. I mean, it, you, it, it can have some good information, but you know, we don't know that who the credible sources are. Um, With Wikipedia, I've always kind of, my argument was when I was using it for school, college, and high school and things that I ne never really used the actual article as a source, but the, the, right. the sources at the bottom, it's kind of is your Google to say, I want this topic, where did you get this information, and those four or five links, ten links at the bottom are kind of going to send you to the best part of the internet, in my opinion. Yes, and I was going to say the same thing, because I like Wikipedia as well, just to if I'm unfamiliar with the topic, I'll go to Wikipedia first and read up about it, and then I'll delve into more resourceful sources. Um, but I usually use it just as my background information, nothing to quote from. Gotcha. Um, and as far as you said, you said a, a very another good topic, something that I'm working on doing um, a better job uh, in school. You're taught uh, to cite your sources for reasons of 
you know, credibility and just to show right. that you're not plagiarizing. But in today's world, it's uh, link building is a huge thing as far as getting your stuff social media recognized or search engine recognized. And you could take credit for an article or an image or things, but the simple thing of leaving the mention of this music was provided by at Jeremiah Craig or at Ken Archie or whoever music you're using or if you're using a different source to be able to link to them um, helps build your own credibility, not only with the readers, but with search engines now. So it's kind of come full circle in the digital age that it's still important, a important thing to do. It is. It is. So um, for us, we're, when we're teaching writing and, and teaching extended responses, we're really having, because our students struggle with, well, I don't want to say struggle, they, they always like to tell you what they read and what they saw, but we're trying to get them to go back and really document, you know, where it came from, what paragraph, what did it say in the text? It's great you have this opinion and you know this, but where did it come from? What was the source? So we're, we're building the, the groundwork and laying that foundation for college. And uh, you just mentioned that you're laying the groundation for college, which um, you had, you're be a great person for one of my little arguments that I hate about education. Uh, Everybody up here, at least in the Ohio school system, they so almost solely teach for standardized tests and they solely teach to get you into college where I don't know if you've seen any of my videos. I'm pretty anti-college. Um, I have gone through college. I always put that. I, I do have the two year degree to make parents happy. But what can you say as an educator for those that are not encouraged by well, you have to do this so you can make it into college? to still harbor that genuine, I want to learn feel. What are you, what are you as an educator for parents? How can they not stress them out even more about you got to get into college, but actually like to learn? So college isn't for everybody. Um, and as an educator, I really do hate having just a one track for all students because all students don't fit that track. And so what happens is, that we have a lot of students who can't meet those bars and who may never be, meet those bars. And so they automatically feel discouraged and that school is not a good option, but we don't provide them anything else. Mm -hmm. um, my sister actually was, you know, not necessarily one of those people, but school was not for her. She did attempt to go to college, didn't work out for her, but she ended up falling into the stenotype institute. She's a court reporter. She makes great money. But you know, the, the problem is we we don't expose students to all of the opportunities that are out there and available for them. And in education, we've got to do a better job because everyone will not go to college. And that's okay. There are other tracks. I mean, you see the reports on the news and in the and you know, and online or wherever, trades are coming back around. Not enough people have been doing trades over the course of the however many years because they've all been going to college. Pretty soon we're going to need plumbers, electricians, and, you know, all these people to fill these positions. I swear it's like we have, like, this thing re fully rehearsed. I know that we've we've had a few failed attempts, but I was just going to bring that up. I, I personally was lucky enough in high school. I went to the vocational program of culinary arts. Right. Um, from like 15 years old, I, I was getting jobs in kitchens, washing dishes and things like that. And I knew there was always going to be a job in a restaurant. So I didn't know how shitty a job in a restaurant really was. But I was able from an early age to go into a two year program where the first year we learned all about the, the business of a restaurant, the, how to do the math, how to prepare things and do all that stuff. And in the second year, we actually ran a full restaurant within the school. And within that program, you know, they had people building houses, they had people doing cosmetology and all those things where personally, there's so much more value to those things to, to go out. And like you said, even if it's not for you to be able to say, because I'm not a chef right now. I mean, I'm a marketer before that. I, I ran a landscaping company for 10 years, but right. I knew from an early age that I had those skills to always fall back on. When, when people mention, like, I'm getting married in a month, I'm catering the whole thing myself. Are like, you? Yeah, because I'm cheap. I, I don't want to pay anybody any money. I don't blame you, especially <laughs> if you know how to do it and you can do it well. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of those you just dust the rust off and you're like, all right, so let's do the math. We got 75 people. We need this much, this much, this much. But you have those skills. Right. Where 
it's equally important to have the skills of reading, like you're saying, literacy is huge, vocabulary, all those communication and things like that. But when's the last time you really needed to know 1776? You know, different things like that that we're teaching that are important, but we're teaching them in a boring way where if we could kind of teach them the skills or you go through school K through 12 and you don't know how to do your taxes. Think about that. Right. right? Absolutely. <laughs> Financial literacy and those pieces need to be there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. But education has changed. So, you know, I will say um, with history, and maybe I'm just a history buff and a history nerd, but I have um, a some of my teacher friends who teach history, if I had had them as my history teachers um, in mm -hmm. school, I would have loved it. Um, we mentioned Oregon Trail the other day. Did you play that? When you um, that? Not much. Okay. Well, they have this project where they teach their students about westward expansion, and they call it Oregon Trail. And just like the game on the computer, they put it on paper, and students have to figure out what their position is, how many people are in their family and try to get them a, across the country. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and the same too, like you said, like how the financial literacy is important and all these other skills that are important. I, I think that as what you're doing is you have the ability to, in the classroom, teach the things that the state, the government, the, the system wants everybody to learn, but then you also have the ability as the author to get that firsthand experience of everything that is going on with the youth of today, and then incorporate those lessons that you see that they're not getting and incorporate that into your books and use your platform, because whether you're in the classroom or in your book or at home or at youth group or wherever you're going, you're still teaching and you're still influencing. I think you're quoted as saying that you are a young adult fiction author in the business of changing lives. Yes, so, so challenging. <laughs> but within that, though, like it's a challenge, but it's a challenge. It's a, a, every day is different for you. And every what is that like as an educator to be able to watch everybody grow and take those skills you're giving them and put them to use? Um. Like I said, it's so it's so challenging, but it's rewarding whenever, um, whenever they get it. Whenever I mean, even if you're trying to teach, like for example, I've got two students in one of my classes um, who they don't know how to receive positivity, but I can tell every day I walk in to teach them. They want my attention. Like they always come up and they say something to me, and it's always rude. So <laughs> you know. You <laughs> always rude but they want my attention and anytime I I try to talk to them positively like they they don't know they don't know how to take it over time they've gotten better with it so for me that's a small reward I don't know what's happened with them you know personally at home um or early on in their lives wherever, wherever whoever their interactions were with friends or what have you but just knowing that I I'm I'm winning them over just a tag. <laughs> it's a good feeling because one of them now, she'll come up to me and she'll just start telling me, you know, things that are happening with different students. And I'm like, I don't know if I really want to know, but then I kind of do. But then I'm like oh, traumatized because I didn't want to know that much. And she'll say, okay, well, I'll tell you more tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, I guess. <laughs> and that brings um, up a good topic of kind of what we hit on the other day of, um, there, you're not the only author slash writer um, slash kind of being a writer. Um, I was thinking about since our last conversation of people that are writers are instantly thinking of how to turn it into a business, how to sell your book. It's a natural process. But right. the more I talk to writers and the more I work with different writers, it, it's really become evident that authors really have to learn how to build a brand before they learn how to sell or anything else because there's a thousand of you in your own state there's a million of you in the country that all write young adult fiction or a similar genre so you have to build that personal connection and you touched on the other day that it's hard to find the balance between being that personality and being the teacher when it's in the classroom can you give anybody advice on what you've tried that's not working and what you try that is working to find that uh, school author balance um, oh, I don't know, because I'm still exploring it. You know, um, we talked the other day about, you know, my Instagram ads and how sponsoring those ads, I really wanted, you know, the young people or my market audience to know that the book is out there and to know that it exists. 
And so with those ads, you're able to specifically target people in certain states. So of course, you know, I chose Florida as the first one, um, Georgia and then California. But what was really interesting was, you know, coming to work every day or coming to work every day and seeing students. I had one person, you know, I'm in the middle of teaching. I'm trying to get them started on what's happening. One individual, his hand was raised and I kept saying, hold on, hold on, not yet. And then after, you know, I, I said what I needed to say, I went back to him and he said, how come your ad keeps popping up on my Instagram? <laughs> so it, it, for me, it's just always finding that fine line because I never want, you know, my administrators or, you know, just my my job to think that I'm, I'm using my platform to solely market books because that, you know, that's not what it's about. You know, at the, exactly. end, of the, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm for you know, the young people and having them educated, but just not educated tradi traditionally, but knowing how to work with each other and build positive relationships with each other and take those, you know, into successes. Um, I, I hate that they're part of this reality show generation because so much, so many, so much drama, they've been introduced to so much drama. And so what young people do is they pattern themselves after what they've seen and they think that's how they're supposed to interact with other people. And so there's this whole fight culture and drama related culture. That's the world star hip hop culture. Right, right. And, and, you know, I've never seen like so many students, you know, so willing to want to not necessarily participate in the fight now, but just watch it and record it to have a video that they can post. Um, you know, and we do a good job of tracking down those who do it. It doesn't happen that often. Um, but just that culture, because I remember growing up and, you know, being that age and my influences were the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you know, a different world, the Cosby show. I'm like, okay, so that's what I want to be like. But here they've got world star hip hop, like you said, and the girls fight club that was on for a long time. And then you've got all the real housewives shows and Everything's just about drama. Well, what's funny to me about like the world, the Real Housewife shows and uh, the Kardashians and all those other ones that we call reality TV that, you know, they're, the kids are watching, soaking this up like those are the real lives, not realizing that there's 18 producers, 47 people of lighting. There's, you know, stylists, beauticians, all of the above to then get 30 seconds of footage that didn't actually happen real. <laughs> right. Um, there's no reality to reality TV shows, no. but people are soaking it up like it's the gospel. Um, not to mention all the events that they have to pre-plan in order to get footage. Like they don't <laughs> see those things. Absolutely. But on that note, let's see how we can get the technology to work. Cause we just talked about Instagram and we were talking about getting the videos and everything else. And as I was working through doing some research on your stuff, Let's go right here, share that one, you click this one. Oh, look at that. That's you on the live stream there. And now we are on your Instagram page. Yes. Um, you are very active on Instagram. Uh, you've got 270 followers. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm trying to get to 500. <laughs> That's super easy to do with it. The tips that I gave you the other day, you'll be there in a month. Um, but something that I wanted to point out is we're looking at 31 likes, 32 likes. Your average is thir about 30 to 40 likes on a post, okay. um, on a picture post. Okay. But when you come to your video, 64. We got another video that was down somewhere around here, 102. Oh, yeah. 65. See, my so, children bring more likes. I need to include them more. Well, not only your children, but the, the point that I was trying to make here is your videos whether it's just you saying hello to people or just kind of give them the update, almost every one of your videos is doubling the performance of your, um, of your um, regular picture posts. Um, have you noticed that? And now that you are aware of that, um, do you think you should make more video posts? So yes and yes. And that's one thing that my husband does talk to me about all the time is doing more videos because he tells me constantly that people like watching videos. Um, so I need to do that. So um, with him, because I know we didn't talk about him much last time, but he, 
he does music. Um, he does music. He's got a st studio and he's got a company, Studio Cafe. So he's launched, you know, some some musicians into the world. So he pays attention to these little things. He's like, oh, you got to do this, this, and this. So for a while, he he was kind of sounding bossy, and I didn't want to listen to him. <laughs> or I would put it in my head, but you know, I say, like, okay, I'll do it later. But no. It, all of you are correct. I do need to do more videos. <laughs> and like, like you said, the, the, to have the knowledge that A, videos are doing better for you than, than visual or text or things like that. Also to have the knowledge that your daughters are also in the things that are getting higher engagement. Um, being able to just use those baseline analytics, not even using like the graphs and everything that they provide you with, right. um, could then just help maximize your time. Same like you said, you need to do more video. I need to do more video and that's why this all of this stuff originally is for a podcast but we're doing it on video because then once we have the video there's so much more shareability of it and you just strip the audio from it right um, which video like you said your your husband's 100 percent correct people will stop when they see a video opposed to when they see a photo they keep scrolling where the whole idea is to get their attention show them a video <laughs> Oh, I guess I'm just so different than other people. People, see, do you know people send me videos all the time, and I look at it and I pretend I've watched it <laughs> and I keep going. But I have to realize not everyone is like me. They like to watch videos. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's nice of you that you're, you know, taking the time. It's kind of like the people that don't hit the ignore on the phone call. You let it just ring all the way through for them, just to make them feel right. like you didn't ignore it. <laughs> Right, that's, that's me. And then people ask me later, did you see that video? Well, I saw it came through. I didn't watch it yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> and on that uh, kind of, you're giving them the support of, yeah, I kind of watched it. I kind of didn't. Um, right. You as an author are also looking for that. It's almost that same exact type of support when you are making a post or when you're making a, a sales claim or an ad, like you said, that you've done the ads. Um, so what do you think as somebody that doesn't like video um, and you're you're do great on video, but you seem like I know you were nervous the first time that we we did video. Wow. How, how do you think you yourself with other people using your uh, psychology degree? How can you get out of that comfort zone and get on video and promote your message with your own personality? Just do it and not think about it. Um, yeah. Really, and that's it. Just do it and not think about it. Because um, I think what happens for me um, with my daughter going to school where I teach, knowing that she reposts things and that, you know, they all see it. And I do want them to see it. Not that I don't, but I don't, it's just really weird and awkward sometimes. <laughs> I mean, that's all it is. I just have to get, I just have to get over that and just do it and not think about it. That's perfect advice. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the movie we watched last night. Something with James Franco, his brother, Seth Rogen, about a guy uh, that made a really bad movie. I don't remember the name of it, but uh, James Franco plays this really weird guy. And this uh, his brother is there in an acting class. And his, his brother kind of, you know, reads the script like this is the script and blah, blah, blah. Where, you know, the, the really creative out there guys, this is the script and blah, blah, blah. And they had a scene in it where they were eating pizza in a, in a diner and the guy pulls out a script, gives the other guy a script and, you know, same thing. He, the guy gets real big and loud and the other guy's like, oh, well, I don't really know, you know, like people are gonna hear us. But right. the whole point of the exercise that the guy was trying to get him to go through is these people don't matter. These people right. will probably never see anybody in this diner again unless you come here every week. Right. Where to, to let yourself express yourself, if you really wanna be an actor, you can't be worried about people's impressions because you're not going to please everybody. Or as an author, you're not going to have all five-star reviews. I don't have all five-star reviews on my podcast. But you have to be able to take that feedback and flip it and say, all right, well, I could do something with this. At least you watched it. Thanks for watching it. You thought it sucked. It sucked. You know? Right. <laughs> and as somebody that teaches kids, how can kids get better um, to accept criticism? Because it's something that's a, a dying breed, I think. Oh my gosh, I'm, just, I, I'm still trying to figure that out myself because, you know, teaching middle school, you know, they're at that, you know, they're going through so many hormonal changes. They don't take criticism at all. They hate, they're, they're quick to want to address conflict. I I don't know. We're still, I'm still trying to <laughs> figure that one out. Um, 
I guess, I don't know. You know, when it comes to, you know, academically, um, data speaks for itself. So we always, you know, do assessments, let them know, you know, how they're performing on certain standards or in certain areas academically. And just having those one-on-one conversations with them to where it's small and it's just, you know, you and the student and they've got a chance to be, they're away from their friends. So they don't have anybody they have to perform for or Mm -hmm. say anything or say anything to or defend themselves. but just starting small, building relationships. I mean, we talked about it before, but even to be able to accept criticism, you've got to build a relationship with a person in teaching anyway um, and create a comfort zone for them, you know, to be able to accept what their weaknesses are and create a path and a plan to help them excel and improve. That's good advice. And with that, uh, I like to use your sound bites against you with a path and a plan. You are currently the teacher, currently an author. What is your plans for your writing career in the next five years? Where do you see yourself as as a writer in five years? Oh, you're asking all these hard questions. Um, You know, I know, number one, the one thing that I'm really working on now is just staying consistent. Um, Staying consistent and building something and just continuing to build. I keep telling myself every, every day, this is a marathon, this is not a sprint. So what I want for myself is going to have to continue to, it, it may be a slow build, it may pick up quickly at some point and it may slow back down again and that's okay. But for me, just staying consistent, consistently writing, consistently um, letting people know who I am, you know, as a person and knowing what my passions are and knowing that my intentions are, you know, are good. They're here to help and to, to um, inspire a generation to do, to be better, whether I'm educating them in the classroom or whether they're learning life lessons through the books that I'm writing. Um, but in five years, I just want my platform to continue to grow and I want to continue, you know, to have pieces that are authentic and meaningful um, placed in front of people so that they can learn from. Excellent. And part of that growing piece like we talked about uh, yesterday was the, the digital piece of it, your mm-hmm. digital branding and all of the imaging of it. Um, within all of the information that um, I talked about yesterday, um, what of that do you think that you're going to put forward? Because um, like, like, like I mentioned, everything that you're doing marketing wise and everything, you're like 60 to 85 percent there on all of it. Like you're, you're spot on on so many of the things. What's the first step to kind of take from where you are now marketing to that next step, do you think? Well, I've already started last night. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, um, you know, honing in on specific posts on Instagram that are relevant to my target audience and comments and messages on people's stories. So I think I gained maybe eight followers you know last night just doing those things um so that's eight followers we do that every day we're at uh two that that, that, that hits me that puts you at 500 by the end of the month no but it'd be more because you know i did it last night but if i can do it throughout the day i can at least get what 10 to 15 i can double that (laughs) and with that with that enthusiasm let me fill in everybody on what we are talking about we talked i get filled her in on what's called the dollar 80 strategy which uh i kind of built on that my own self um with a few different platforms but the whole idea is to go out and give your two cents to 90 people a day um and you can break that up throughout the day which i do recommend personally i do um the first thing i do when i wake up is i go through all my social media feeds see how many followers i got see who i lost fill in comments and then start to go to leave comments and the idea is to not just say thumbs up or just a smiley face on all of them, but to actually leave something meaningful. So if it's like, like, like who are, if we're a young adult author and you're going, I personally would go and find a whole bunch of teenagers mm-hmm. who are having their emo day of, oh, well, life sucks and blah, blah, blah. If you go give them that right piece of inspiration and make it really seem viable and genuine, they're going to go click that button and see, oh, let me see what's this author all about. Or myself as a marketer, when I see people um, and we just talked about people don't like criticism, but I give people 
criticism all day long. But I, I say it, try to say it in a way of, this is what you're doing good. This is how you could be doing it better. So that is actually re receivable. Where if you're leaving 90 comments a day or 100 comments a day, because you really want to be out there to grow and build those connections, because most people aren't going to look at them. But those that do, like you said, you picked up eight people overnight just by talking to people, by trying to start a conversation. And I think I only did it for like an hour because I, I was sleepy last night. I fell asleep on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then part of social media that we also talked about, I do want to kind of highlight your um, website. Your Alicia Caldwell Henderson dot WordPress dot com. Um, that is uh, what all can people find if they go there? So right now, just my blogs. Um, and you know, my idea behind that, you know, I titled it to my daughters because you know, I think about girls, um, not just my own, but just, you know, girls and what I want for them growing up. Because there's so many of the wrong influences out there and so many people who pattern themselves after the wrong influences or feel like they have to um, do certain things based on what everybody else thinks and what have you. So in my blog, I, I address topics that you know, our hot topics or situations that are hot situations, you know, in a manner to offer advice to my daughters, but other girls as well. And you're doing a pretty good job on hot topics. I see we're talking about R. Kelly right as he hit the news. We got things about your journey. We got all sorts of fun stuff on there. Um, and you are on WordPress, you're on social media and things like that, but your daughter, let's give her a free shout out. Do you, uh, what is her YouTube channel? Cause she's doing some really creative and original things on there. Um, Ashlyn reacts on YouTube and what she does is reacts to Bible verses. Um, <laughs> the first one she did, it, it really happened by accident because we, um, as a family, decided to do some family devotional. So I ordered this book on Amazon. It was everyone's favorite, right? Uh, so I ordered a book on Amazon and we did a devotional that night. And she wanted to keep going. She said, nope, we're going to do a whole Bible study. Mind you, she's 12. Um, so, you know, we love the energy. So anytime there's some positive energy coming out of her and we're like, okay, we just run for it. And we, we do, we go, we, we do it. So she pulled out the Bible and she said, okay, so what book are we going to? I said, well, my favorite book is Proverbs and my husband was like Psalms. And then our six year old didn't even want to participate. Anytime we do devotional, she thinks the world is over and we're killing her. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Ashlyn said, well, no, nope, I'm going to Genesis because that's where all the drama is. So she picked up in Genesis and she's been doing her reaction videos for over a month now. Um, following the story of Jacob, um, when she did it initially that night, she didn't record it. We were just listening to her read because she we let her take you know take ownership because that's what she wanted to do have the Bible study. So she was reading, and as she was processing, she was making faces and then commentary like, oh, "That's not right." Nice. So we we were just laughing at her because it was so funny to hear her reactions and then we said you really need to record yourself <laughs> doing this because it's so funny and and she has um she's even invited on one of her friends and they did one um part of jacob's story where um he was married to leah and married to rachel but of course, he only loved Leah, really. He was tricked into marrying. I mean, he only loved Rachel. He was tricked into marrying Leah. And so in those verses specifically, you know, she's having children and she's like, oh, surely he'll love me now. So she and her friend, they, they stop and they're like, um, having a baby is not going to make a man love you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's interesting and it, it, it's cool. I'm proud of her. She's very ambitious, but I guess she can't help it with with parents like she has, because neither one of us can sit, so our hands are always in something. Nice. How do we spell it? <laughs> <laughs> but she's doing really good. She's got 33 subscribers. I just made it 34. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, but her first video, she's got over 100 views. Yeah, she's got 140 right there. Let's put the screen on so everybody could see what we're talking about here. Click yeah. that, oh. and there we oh. are. Now, yeah, we, we've got Ashlyn Reacts, and that's two S's A S H L Y N E 
R E A C T S S for everybody on the podcast that has no idea what we're talking about about these things on the screen. Yeah, this is um, how the people write now. And as a author, as a reader, you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but you also design covers. So what do you look for in a book, physical book? Well, it's got to be attractive to me. I mean, for me, just with that graphic design background, right? I don't want to see like dark like a dark cover and dark print because I can't read it. I can't, if I have to do so much work to figure out what's going on, I, I just automatically just move on. I, I can't, it's, it's gotta, you know, you learn about white space and the spacing and, you know, I look for all those things. I don't like too, too many things that are busy. And something that I've been thinking about more and more um, because my home internet is awful and I'm always at a library to do my uploads and things. Yeah. Um, everybody's, you know, you have the don't judge a book by its cover uh, slogan, but as a designer, what do you think? I personally think the spine of a book is far more important than the actual cover, being that every book in a library is spine. What, what can you do on the spine part to really set yourself out? I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do because if you start experimenting a lot, then it becomes too busy and then people kind of look past it because they're trying to figure out what's going on, right? Um, so as far as the font, you want the font to be clear and you want it to be bold. You want it to be something that's easy to read. And if you're contrasting, if you're using colors, make sure they're contrasting colors so mm -hmm. that the type, you know, is it, set out. Uh, yeah. My recent idea, um, and again, I've never tried this out, but as a person that's walking through a library, I know everybody, the standard thing on the spine is your name and the book title, obviously. Right. What if you just put something going down the spine of the book, say, pick this up, look at my cover? And now that would get people's attention. It would get people's attention. And I think, too, it'd be one of those as... I mean, you're, you're sending your books and things to different libraries and different right. uh, bookstores. As somebody that's so, they see books every day, right. that yeah. one difference, because again, you're not looking at anything other than that thing to catch your eye. But if, right. if you have a black cover and you have a bright orange thing with white or black text that says, pick me up or anything like that call to action thing, you're yeah. instinctively going to be like, what the hell is this? But listen, the, the first person to do it will have started a craze. So I guess that means I got to hurry up and finish yeah. it before I can do that, right? Because right now my study guide isn't a thick enough thing to really make that that that, that functional. But yes, too. Yes. And on that same note, what is something that you in the next months or years are going to think out of the box with marketing um, to kind of get out of your, your own comfort box. What's something that you want to try as somebody that also has a bit of a marketing background? Um, oh, I, I've never considered myself to have a marketing background. If, if you do graphical design, you can't say that you don't know marketing because okay. all marketing is in packaging. <laughs> um, I don't know. Cause like I said the other day, you know, I feel like I've just dropped into this world because, you know, I finally made up my mind to just go ahead and do it. So I'm looking at different pieces and I'm learning and I'm figuring out how to project myself further. So I'm looking at, I'm not opposed to anything. So I'm reaching out to people locally who have events. There's um, a foundation called Blue Skies Foundation. I reached out to them a couple of weeks ago because I see they do like this local authors and artists kind of thing. Um, so we're talking about doing something in the summer. Um, I, I don't know, outside of the, tri you know, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around doing some of the traditional things that I haven't really thought about jumping outside of the box just yet. Um, I don't know, but I'm open. Open. So when, whenever I come up with a crazy idea, keep throwing it your way. I got it. <laughs> oh, please. Because I'll say, okay, how can I do it? So, you know, after we spoke yesterday, um, my daughter decided, you know, Ashlyn decided she wanted to talk to me too about my book. And I forget what this is called. I don't want to yell at her, but it's some type of little video where you sit and you talk to people while you're eating. Um, them. I don't know the name of it, but I know those things are huge in like a the Asian countries. Okay, so she wanted to do that yesterday, and she she discovered that DoorDash delivers to us, so she used her money <laughs> and ordered sushi and soup, <laughs> and we sat, and we 
did a video. So, I mean, I guess that's I consider it out of the box too. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I'm just pilfering my way through. And if something jumps out at me, I'm like, okay, let's do it. Absolutely. And, and having that open mind, I think, is what's going to give you the edge and be, make you able to really uh, keep selling more books and, and really building that brand is because um, just like everything that I, we've talked about, as soon as you hear something and you're like, there's some merit to that, you pick up that pencil that's been in or that pen that's been in your hand and you're like, I'm going to write that down. And you also you're have the also the the collective knowledge to be like, I'm going to write this down and go back to it and read more about it to, to go at it and try new things. So with that, I think you're ahead of 90% of the people in your author group that are so confined to what it, the, I guess, just the social image of an author is just right. the, like, I don't need to market. I, I, I make a quality book. Like nobody cares about your thousand page book. They really don't like, Nobody cares about anything other than the personal connection. And I think, like you said, having those videos with your daughter or hopping on podcasts and in the same area where you're reaching out to libraries and people for events, do the same thing that I told you for the, the going through the explore and type in podcasters, YouTubers, and start I'm making sorry. that connection. <laughs> I did that yesterday. Last there time. it is. <laughs> Because just like you're learning with, with the podcast thing, and there's the two angles of it. From my angle of it, I get to talk to people. I get to get, you know, with the hour that we spend, I should be able to get 10 to 15 pieces of content out of it. Right. So then that helps me do what I do and then helps me build my portfolio. But then also we're talking about your book and everywhere that any of my stuff goes, your links to your book is going to be, and people are going to see you. They're going to be like, oh, this lady is a human. She teaches kids. She's a great lady. We should probably help her out. So like you're, you're building your brand and you're building it in a fashion that's good for you. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. So let's wrap it up with the last little bit. I want to focus 100% about your book for the last five, about five minutes. Um, it is a young adult fiction. Mm -hmm. And you like young adult fiction because you deal with young adults and you want to help teach them. Um, but where do you see any other sequels coming to the book or how do you plan? Cause I know we talked the other day where you're not the movie thinker, but you know, everybody in your family is the movie thinker. How can you help build not only your own brand, but the brand of young, dumb and naive? Um, so what I'm thinking, um, or what I, what I really want to do with it is, you know, like I shared with you guys before that each, like the characters, or the main characters are spawned from inspirations of people in my family, right? So I've got one younger cousin who was the inspiration for the character Zerika. Um, but I kind of want to leave this with, you know, just Zerika, right? So my next book, I have another cousin who's younger, who he is the inspiration behind the story for my next book. Um, and that one is a little bit heavier because it deals with the relationship, the close relationships that you have with people you love, but but they are suffering through addictions. Um, so I'm just, you know, taking his experiences and his emotions or what I imagine him to feel, because we've never had these conversations, but, you know, I'm always there for him whenever he needs me for anything. Um, and he will, he'll call me on Facebook Messenger. <laughs> just, he called me at one night. 11 30 it was like a school night i'm like going to sleep but you know i answer because it's him and 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 i know what his life has been like so you know i just want to make sure i'm there for him but he's the inspiration for the next book and just what i imagine you know him to fill out feel like but the character you know the character is not necessarily him or is not him the character has a whole different storyline but just using those emotions that I feel like he may have. So with each book, it's going to be, you know, spawned and based off of, you know, a person in my family because, you know, they all have a story. <laughs> nice. And then um, what I want to do here is let's do a quick little tech trick. Boom, boom, boom. And one more boom. So on the screen, we have your Amazon page where everybody can go get both your print book, your Kindle book, and everything like that. Um, give us a quick one minute, maybe two minutes. Um, just go over the synopsis of the book. What can people expect um, when they pick this up and go to read it? 
um, kind of like the storyline kind of just give sink our teeth in just a little bit to where we have to go get the whole thing ordered from food grub <laughs> well as erica christian she's 14 she's the main character she is the oldest child of her mother candace she has two younger siblings melina and chauncey um melina's eight chauncey is he's a toddler um she's always had to be their surrogate mother always she's always walked the straight line and done things for her mother um just like her mother has wanted her to do um but she's in ninth grade now and she's like i don't want to do that anymore i want to be me i want to live for me i want to do the things that i want to do she's in a position where she's making all these great new friends because she's also a cheerleader when you're involved in athletics you meet so many people you know within your school and those people who are considered to have influence and who are popular and so she's just she's following behind them and she's like learning she's like a little I don't want to say lost puppy, but she's just, she's naive. I mean, before coming to the school, she was in a private school. Her best friend um, at the time, um, you know, she's Christian, she's saved, and she walks this tight line, but Erica's like, I, I don't want to. This is just not who I want to be anymore. Um, so as she's redefining herself and trying to figure out things on her own, and she's getting into some things that she shouldn't be getting into, and her mom isn't noticing. And one of the rain, main reasons why her mom isn't noticing is because her mom's life is falling apart. Like her mom needs her even now more than ever because financially she just doesn't know what to do. She's not getting the financial support that she used to. And she's just trying to figure life out again. But because she's so preoccupied in what's happening in her own life, she's not noticing what as Erica is getting involved in and, and new influences as Erica has. Um, and it comes to a head, you know, later on in the book when she's having to be forced to notice what's happening because of the situation. And by that time, she's, you know, she has to depend on faith and love to, to pull them through. Excellent description. I don't know if you if you look there, but I kind of scrolled through your preview <laughs> and about the first chapter of everything just uh, was able to be seen and kind of give the people the little uh, heads up of what to see, give them the sneak preview. Um, and just from that one little bit of chapter that I was just looking at through, like you do a really good job of being that it's for the young adults, like you could already tell, like through, through the words that, that it's not written as a, a teacher that's trying to talk to them in the thing. Like you could already tell through the language and everything of the dialogue that it's it's written for the teens, but it's also by somebody that, like you said, you have the, the psychology background, you have the 10 plus years of being in the classrooms and teaching and doing all those things. So you, you know how to interact with them, you know how to communicate. And that's the biggest part of telling the story is just finding a way to communicate with your preferred reader. So I think you're doing the spot on job with that one too. Good, look at you go. I'm trying, like my, my, my ammo in life is whatever I do, I need to be the best at it. <laughs> Absolutely. Whatever it is in whatever moment, that's always my goal. So let's just do a quick one to, uh, let's get like two sound bites out of this and we'll clip okay. them out. Um, we'll put the screen on me. Um, everybody, it's Colin of Colin Can Help. And I want you to go check out the new book, Young, Dumb and Naive. There's gonna be links in the descriptions. It's a fantastic book for young adults. And if you don't check it out, you just messed up your entire life. So that's a, a quick little sound bite. Um, I'll do a couple more of them for you. But if I could just get you to give me a quick, you know, this is uh, this is Alicia Caldwell Henderson, Colin Cowell podcast, one of those type of things. Okay. Um, how long do you, what else do you want me to say in it? Like just say, you know, this, this is who I am. I was on the Colin Cowell podcast. Um, check it out, and when you're done, check out my book or something like that. Hey, this is Alicia Caldwell Henderson on Colin Can Help Podcast. I've had such a great time talking with Colin today. Please um, take a moment, check out my book, Young, Dumb, and Naive, and enjoy the listen.